Joining me today on streaming audio is Fred Patton, who's part of SwimOS, which is an interesting project that kind of blurs the line between a distributed computing network and a stream processing layer and a live user interface framework. It's large and it's ambitious, and when I first heard about it, I could tell it was interesting, but I couldn't quite pin down exactly what it was. So we asked Fred to come in and take us through it. Uh, along the way, we go from taking inspirations from Erlang and Scala to rewrites into Java and Rust for performance, and to TypeScript programs, which are talking to a mesh of agents out on the web to build up a user interface. I don't think I can do it justice in one minute, but Fred does a great job of outlining the project in 30. As ever, streaming audio is brought to you by our education site, Confluent Developer. More about that at the end. But for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is streaming audio. Let's get into it. My guest today is Fred Patton. Fred, welcome to Streaming Audio. Hey, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. It's good to have you. Um, you're going to clarify something in my mind for me, I think, today. Because um, you are, let me get this right, you're a developer evangelist at Swim Incorporated. Yes. And I was looking at Swim, and I was, my first impression was I was blown away by the ambition of it. My second was I couldn't quite get my head around exactly what it is, because it kind of reminds me of Kafka. It kind of reminds me of Erlang and um, Scala, Acker Streams. It kind of reminds me of a distributed web scale operating system. What is it, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, when you mentioned Erlang and you mentioned uh, uh, Akka, that that's a good start because at its core, it is a distributed actor, actor system. Okay. It, it, it's not the same. It takes a departure because it's really about real-time streaming. So it's not so much about, um, uh, you know, general distributed computing where you're really tying together certain services and you've got all the supervision and those type of things. It's, it's really about the real-time context. So um, w what do we mean by streaming applications, first of all? We might start there because that can mean different things to different people. And in, in this case, we're not really talking about video. We're really talking about uh, data and information. And so when you've got stream processing, you've really got a um, kind of an overarching um, computation that's going across a lot of nodes and workers. It's kind of, you can think of it kind of like laying down railroad tracks, right? Everything has to be in service of this computation to work at scale and you use certain operators and you funnel everything together so you can basically uh, solve a computation, which is generally like an aggregation or a summation, that type of thing. Yeah. For streaming applications, on the other hand, it's really gotta be general purpose. It, they, the, each application needs a certain degree of uh, autonomy and you can't pre-script everything. And the other factor is, so I, I guess I'll back up a little bit if we can think about something like the Lambda architecture, where you have the speed layer, you can kind of think of streaming applications in that aspect. You've got all the other state being uh, serialized, going to different places, doing the different batch processing, getting stored at the end of the day. But if you really need um, some real-time insights and streaming throughout, you've got those other things uh, sorted out. So really what you want here is basically nonstop streaming. You don't want to do like a stop the world GC pause and do anything with disk. You just yeah. got to keep things flowing. And one of the thing, one of the differentiating factors of swim is that, uh, um, is that it goes all the way to the client, right? It goes all the way to the UI. And actually, if you imagine connecting uh, a fire hose to a browser, that's a recipe <laughs> for disaster. And so uh, swim does, does a lot of things to uh, be able to handle that which we can get it more into. Okay, so let, let's pin that down a bit more because um, I, I know a few ways to do stream processing, right? Kafka Streams is obviously one we're concerned with locally here on streaming audio. Yeah. But so 
I'm getting the sense from you that the first big difference is each process might be running on, in a very distributed way at a completely different part of the web. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, but they also might be running um, um, locally as, as per normal. You, you might have a bunch of similar nodes on a rack, a bunch of different processes on a, on a particular machine. Uh, we do very lightweight um, uh, what we call stateful microservices. You can think okay. them as of them as actors, and um, and so one thing that we do, you know, back pressure is typically done on a connection basis, right? Uh, um, the consumer and the producer, and for Swim to work at scale and and to be able to go to browsers and stuff like that, uh, we have to handle that um, across the endpoints. So. Any real time, any um, real time UI bit is probably going to be consuming many streams, and so we will basically, you know, handle the demux and mux so that everything kind of, you know, flows together. And we don't have any batching where we can't really afford to delay. But then we kind of amortize that by all the different streams that a particular endpoint might be consuming or pushing out. If that makes sense. Um. So g- pin that down for me. What's the, g- give me a use case yeah. that that okay. kind of processing might happen and we can talk about the specific data. So if you do typical stream processing, you're, you're basically kind of um, materializing a certain view. So you want a certain answer. And so you're, you're processing that and you're pushing uh, that stream of data to a particular consumer. And this is all the answers here. For our case, there's going to be, lots of different sources pushing the data as soon as possible uh, whenever things are changing on. So we're fine grained on an entity level. So as things change, it could be like a traffic light, it could be uh, IOT machine, whatever bit of data, as soon as they're passing, all the interested subscribers are basically um, getting those streams nonstop from the different aspects. And so what we do is that we handle the back pressure on the level of all those streams coming into a certain destination as opposed to individually. Okay, so let's say uh, traffic's an interesting one. So I've got cameras detecting the flow of traffic at certain junctions, right? Um, And presumably that's raw. That's just, I saw a car, I saw another car. Exactly. That's streaming in. And then you're trying to aggregate that into a local picture of how much traffic is in that area. Yeah, and so uh, that's a good point because what we do is that a lot of that is, you know, it's going to really keep telling you, I, I, I see a car, I see a car, I see a car or whatever. And what you care about in the business standpoint is, is it open? Is it busy? When will the light change? And so mm-hmm. we're all about um, handling all the deltas and the, the information bits at scale. So we don't want to send all of that data like that. We want to basically um, send the information, the, the particular deltas, uh, predictions, So would you expect to have some degree of processing running at or near the specific traffic light camera? Uh, Typically, yes. It doesn't have to be that case. But yes, often that is the case. And in that case, a lot of that data um, gets thrown out. And so you don't stream all of that up into the uh, the edge or the cloud. So that's the ideal case. We've run things on Raspberry Pis. And, and other type of things for the, for those purposes. And is some part of the SWIM operating system is managing the state of all these different, can I, what should I call them, actors around the network? Yeah, we like to call them stateful microservices these days. Okay, fair enough. But I'll, I'll go with either. And yes, um, okay. and so um, it's managing um, basically as a, as a massive view. So based on the all the consumption patterns you know there's you basically can think of certain graphs that have to happen and then as a meaningful update happens in any of the sources those get propagated along and so you're really just um, based on your on on your processing needs and what has changed you're just subscribing to all the relevant data okay so i'm building up a processing graph in in some programmatic fashion. Yes, that can be static or ad hoc 
you know, real, real time. You don't have to do it ahead of time. Okay. So wh- what, what part does swim do for me? Cause I could kind of do that with like RPC calls between different Java nodes around the world. What, what, what swim bringing to that structure? Swim, yeah. Swim brings endless streaming, right? So everything is a subscription. And after that, there's no requests. There's no polling. Data just flows unchecked. There is only really the handling of the, of the back pressure to not overwhelm you know, the sources. And so okay. you're, you, you don't, there, there's no querying of a database or internal state. There's no making requests. You basically just link to the information that you need and the data constantly uh, flows there you know, at an acceptable rate. Okay. So it's like building up a graph of publish subscribe connections between different nodes. Absolutely. Okay. And is there like a management section to that? Uh, like, so um, putting on my Erlang hat, my very tiny little Erlang hat. I love Erlang, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't spent enough time with it, but I find the ideas in it very interesting. Like, I guess the first thing you're going to want is what happens if one of those nodes crashes? Is there some means to monitor and ensure the health of the graph that you're building up? Yeah, um, there, there is a management layer where it, for, um, you know, connections dropping, especially since the, the streaming should happen nonstop, that those will just automatically get reloaded, even rebalanced. It might need to be on a different node. Mm-hmm. And so... And you might need uh, duplicate copies. So there is a layer that basically um, handles, you know, the different processing components and, you know, monitors them for availability. But, okay. and, and we even have uh, things where we can actually store that stuff when you really want to on disk, but really as, as like a speed layer type approach. And you're already, you know, I- any data is that you're feeding to us you're probably also feeding them if you don't want to lose anything in, you know, to your data warehouse or whatever, you're already doing it anyway. So we just try to focus on, on the live real-time streaming it with the idea that uh, you really only care about information with a certain time window where you want to take action. And so okay. we generally don't worry about um, all the agent history because you're going to query that and you can already batch process and, and do all that type of stuff otherwise. Okay, so for for back pressure, you are kind of in the extreme case, you're dropping data and just saying, if it's too old, we don't consider it anymore. Yeah, generally, there's a certain look back, which makes sense for the application. It's it's application defined. So basically, how much you want. Um, So we we don't try to assume how much data will be kept. But just general use cases to date are really about being able to... um, act in real time, right? So whether it's a yeah. user or an automated process. There's always this debate over exactly what real time is and hard and soft real time. But I think we can generally all agree that newer is more valuable and we work from there, right? Yeah, because once it's been consumed, like if you send a message to to someone and they can decide if they want to take action or not, then they probably don't need anything they don't need it anymore. But if there's certain um, algorithms running where you do have some back window that you're using, um, then of course you, you need you need a certain amount of data that that recent data is still valuable. But once it's not needed for the decisions that you're making and the processing that you're making, there's really mm-hmm. no need to keep it. Okay, I can see that point philosophically. So what's it like to program when I'm right? Is it is it Java? Is it Java only? Yes, yes, it is. It's, it's oh. well, it's TypeScript on the on the client side, and right. we are well on our way to with our Rust rewrite. So that should be coming. Um, uh-huh. I, I don't want to put the. It's coming soon. Okay, yeah. Don't absolutely don't commit to delivery dates on this podcast. <laughs> I'll, so I'll don't be asking to do, too much of anyone. Yeah. So with Rust in there, you know, if you want to do Python and other things, that becomes. Uh, much more palatable. Initially, everything was Scala, and initially we we did actually use Aka initially, but okay. sc- scalability was a huge issue since um, our models are again uh, different. This idea of um, only once processing a lot of those type of needs are very are very specific 
we're, we're not really concerned about storing things for the long term in optimal patterns. We're really about getting all the relevant context in one place and streaming it, and then just streaming the updates. So to that brings to me to another of my questions, like bringing all the relevant data to one place. So what do you do about like joining disparate streams of data? Yeah, so you can think of them as streaming joins. So what we what we call ourselves is uh, entity parallel. So, uh, you know, entities are different things to different people. Your group might be caring about certain fields or attributes of a general entity, while another group might look at it a little bit differently, might need data from other places as part of that join. So that's really kind of a, uh, a these are really two kind of related but different entities. And so uh, it's basically the meaningful object that uh, you want to consume. So if you think of a query where you're doing your joins and everything, that resulting thing that you got is really a sort of entity. So it might be that I'm interest that I consider my entity to be a specific traffic light ID, or I might be planning for a whole state and it's just like uh, a block. Yeah, a block yeah. level join of traffic lights. Yeah, but, or it might be okay at this intersection, and then part of this intersection, yeah. you it might include its nearest neighbors, right? So that as as the as the previous light is changing and something's happening there, that next light will want to know type of thing. So you might have little neighborhood clusters like that. Right. And are there restrictions on those kinds of joins? Because I know we think about that a lot in things like Kafka streams. What kind of joins make sense for streaming data? So w what's your thinking around that? Is it easier because you're only you're, you're allowed to drop older data? Yeah, it's it, it's easier from that standpoint, and um, a lot of the work to, for instance, a lot of times when you're doing stream processing and, and you have di different things, they're really kind of isolated. You're really doing a lot of redundant work where it's setting all of these things up. In this case, because there's a, basically a, a grid of web agents, and as connections are made, that kind of you're always optimizing for. Uh, you know, the routes that are being used. Like if you might stop requesting something, then you don't need to worry about it anymore. So I, I would say that in here, it's really um, um, kind of really ad hoc so that you're, you're just basically reacting to demand and linking the appropriate nodes that you need for consumers. And so if they overlap, you get that reuse, like things might flow through node A and then B prime and B might both use that. And if it's the same consumer, it won't be two separate runs of that. Okay, so there, so you can have multiple uh, nodes subscribing to the same source feed. Absolutely. From another node. And, okay. and they can connect and deconnect. And is it load balanced inherently or is that an application level concern? Uh, it, it is because to, to be able to, um, again, uh, those real time UIs really will easily get overwhelmed. And if you, if you go back to the traffic case, um, if you're looking at the whole, we won't say the whole United States, we'll say all of the UK, right? Okay. If you're looking at all Are you of the implying UK, that my home country is small? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're right. You are right. But, <laughs> um, then you know, it's level of detail, right? So what we, we have a lot of operators for um, uh, geographies and, and different things. And so as you're consuming data, you don't need necessarily all the data until you kind of drill down and then you need to see more of it. And so we, we, we handle that case where we can basically dynamically manage the level of detail based on how much can be consumed in real time. It's no use showing someone more information uh, than they can handle and less relevant information based on where they're drilling down. So we, we work in that way as well. Okay. I think we should talk more about the UI because I've, from what I know of SWIM, it felt like some, like an operating system first thing, but I'm getting the sense that actually the user interface is a very big part of this for you. Yeah. The user interface implementation wise in, in TypeScript 
that's really basically we, we call our actually we, we call our um, staple microservices technically we call them web agents because web they're addresses. all um, web addressable they're all basically uris you could hit them from just in a simple web way and start you know uh, consuming them as a stream and so uh, our the ui is basically made up of ui web agents that share a lot of the same similarities and so okay. Um, th- there's really more of a parity on, on both ends. But they're written in TypeScript? Yes. Yes. Okay. And is that is that running in the browser or running on Node? Or how do I uh, set both. that up? You, you can do it both ways. We'll often run things in the browser, and then we might go to the command line and, and run things in Node. We can even hit it with curl because, again, um, they, they are URIs. And so you might... Uh, hit it in curl and just kind of see the data flowing through. You can use the um, CLI and and subscribe to the WebSocket and, and see stuff continue to come through. And it's very similar to what you see in the browser. Okay. So it's this distributed mesh of processing nodes that I can connect to in multiple ways, including rendering out a UI. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And so, and so the UI can really say that... Um, it can pick in multiple sources. I, I want to consume from maybe all of the cell towers in in certain district of Washington D.C. or Paddington Square, wherever. <laughs> um, and and that again is dynamic. Okay, take take me through the flow there because I'm I'm curious about the hatch, how that actually works under the hood. I let's say I am displaying traffic light data for the. St- the East Coast states of America, right? And yeah. I decide I'm going to zoom in on the state of New York. So presumably I'm subscribed to some web agent that aggregates at the level of states. Absolutely. So what happens is you, you might have a state web agent yeah, and then it has what we call a join lane. And this join lane is going to um, some sub areas, some, some regions or counties or however you're breaking it down for gran- granularity. Mm. So basically it's deciding to um, listen to multiple sources and each of those sources are probably listened to multiple sources. So you really get kind of like a, um, a, a tree in that respect. You know, all the states will basically aggregate up to a, a country one. So you might have the US node that's got the 50 states and Washington DC. So Okay, so so there's a bunch of say fifty nodes feeding into a countrywide node. My web UI is subscribed to the countrywide node, and then I sort of cancel that subscription and subscribe to the New York node instead. Yeah, so the New York node would get privileged as you kind of uh, zoom in. We have the yeah. geo coordinates around things, so that as you zoom in, yes, your level of detail will kind of transition to to New York once you've kind of started drilling down into New York. So the game of writing the UI becomes knowing which nodes you can subscribe to for different feeds of data at the level of granularity you want. Yeah, you're kind of like, you're kind of like um, there's a certain you think there's a certain zoom factor. So when you first look at it and you're zoomed out, then all of that basically map in view. Then mm-hmm. all of those data sources can can come in at that level and probably just the higher level data at that point based on how much that browser's throughput has. And then as you zoom in, it basically updates the surrounding regions and figures out which web agents are responsible for that. And then it starts, it switches and subscribes to those. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. You say it figures out. Is there like a discovery mechanism involved there? Or does it just have to know? Yeah, basically, there's a a notion of kind of like a bounding box. You're certain of of a view. So a, a lot of our um, projects have are dealing with uh, geo coordinates, and we have uh, specific data structures for handling that efficiently. And then just the changes. So really, as your coordinate space changes, there's a a very efficient lookup that we'll figure out which web agents are are in that area and which ones need to, you know, keep start subscribing or and continues to subscribe and which ones basically can drop off. 
Right. So I'm working with some kind of discovery service to to know which nodes to change to. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's okay. I'm starting to get a sense of how this would work in my head. Um, what are people using it for out there? Who, who are your cu- typical kinds of customers? So uh, t- big telephony is a big one. Um, you know, that makes sense. often like 150 million active connections needing um, up, up to the second information coming through. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we, you know, normally, like you might say, okay, here's a user, right? You might say this is um, basically quality of service type thing. A user has a problem. You can say, oh, okay, yeah, contact that user. They have a problem, right? Yeah. And generally, if you wanted to know what cell tower they were connected into that moment, you would basically have to do a query to do some lookup to figure that out. But here, as an application standpoint, uh, you would know that automatically you would have, your queries would have that right context. And so you'd be basically keeping context, whether it's static or dynamic, flowing away at any particular time. And so when you see that, uh, yeah, these users are affected and this is a cell tower that's causing it, you, you'll have that all at once because that's the essential information that, that you need at that time. Is that because you're always passing, trying to get a sense of how that works? Are you passing the some of the graph information along with each piece of data in the graph? Yeah, each um, each agent has links to uh, the relevant information that it needs. And so for a, um, for an individual like cell phone, that would be represented as a very lightweight web agent. And mm. as it moves around and connects to different cell towers and other type of things, that's already kept and stored with that state. And okay, so you, you can discover the current connections and you've got... A, a uh, web agent at that level of granularity. Yes, yes. We try to make right. every every entity a web agent because it's it's very um, uh, they're very lightweight. Okay. Um, th- can you quantify very lightweight in like Javary terms? Yeah, it's it's been a what well, kilobytes. I'd say um, you've really got. It's it's really been a long time. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm recently back to swim after having uh, worked a lot on the back end uh, previously, but I would say probably a couple kilobytes if I if I don't misremember. Okay. Order of magnitude uh, is fine. Yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going to grill you for that level of detail. <laughs> and kind okay. of similar, where you might have something passivating and activating based on on need, right? Like if you have again, like with the 150 web agents that are that are created. Um, hmm they might not all be active at that point because if, if something hasn't been used in a while and just resources, it kind of might be passive at that moment. But as it comes up, it's pulled from local disk. If it's kind of phased out a little bit and then once it's up again, then it, then it's ready and doing everything with memory and CPU. Okay. So there is some notion of persisting the state of each um, web agent. Yeah, for the... Um, at, at the end of the day, there's basically in-memory structures that can, based on requirements, get written locally as needed. Okay. Interesting. How old is this project? Um, it's, it's about uh, seven, eight years, I guess. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It goes back a while. The, the initial applications were different. There was the IoT phase. There was the um, web monitoring phase. So a lot right. of it's been kind of, um, you know, if you think what we're talking about are really general purpose uh, features, a lot of it depended on which um, customers were excited or interested at the time. And so sure. actually sure. I, I, did, I did work um, – uh, pick and place machines on on factories, and a lot of it was kind of doing anomaly okay. detection, where uh, predicting issues with nozzles and things like that, and yeah. basically allowing people to kind of get advance notice and take action. That no, that makes perfect sense to me. Like a, a newish company with uh, a core idea, looking for ways to solve people's problems, you would especially when you're new, you gravitate towards different specific industries as time went on. 
But the ideas, I'm assuming, have remained fairly stable over the past seven, eight years. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Um, and there is some degree, I believe, of integration with Kafka, right? Yeah. Uh, as a distributed log and a source of events, I mean, even probably any mature, most mature, a great majority of our customers use use Kafka because, you know, it, it makes sense for uh, an event-driven system and one that mm. has to ma maintain a lot of state. And so because we know Kafka works very well for those things and handles certain data, when it comes into Swim, you're kind of like in the real-time context. You've got your application that you're trying to execute. And so we don't try to do the things that Kafka would have to do with exactly once processing and all these other type of things because that, that information is already there. What we're mm. trying to do is that um, in the real time, we need to, to know right away. And if you're a user, you need it to hit your screen and you need to be able to react and have it go back. If you're a, um, a bit of automation, then you need to get that into your program as soon as possible and take action. Yeah. So that's why we're optimized really for, uh, we're the, basically the speed layer again. That, that's how I look at it. And you're optimizing both for speed and for visibility. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because um, if you, because they're general purpose applications and uh, different groups can have very different requirements and, they, and they, they won't be coordinated ahead of time, you basically have to make decisions based on where the user is and what they're trying to do and what they can handle at a particular time. Makes sense. It's it's a really interesting idea. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where I've got a much better idea of how it works now. So thank you. Um, but it was also makes me want to write some code to actually get my hands dirty and understand because you never really understand something until you've written some code to yes. play with it, right? Yes. So if someone wanted to get started with these ideas and play around with it, where should they start? Yeah. Uh, um, Swim OS is a is a great place to start. Uh, um, there's tutorials there, and uh, that's swimos.org, right? Yeah, right. We'll put a link in the show notes. Um, and what what got you into this world? So I love distributed computing. It's kind of like you know one of the things. Like no, I'm not. Uh, of Raft Master or Paxos or <laughs> the deepest part, but just really very involved systems kind of coordinating and, and having all the negotiations and having kind of all that complexity having to be managed, you know, really attracts me. And um, at the time, it's like I had done some Erlang previously hmm. and I had done some Akka previously. And so when I heard, uh, you know, distributed actor model, and it was Scala at the time. Everything was in Scala. And so I, I was very excited about that. The reason things move from Scala is because the, the Scala runtime is um, a lot larger and heavier. And mm. we needed to run on some very small, small low-powered devices. And so it, it made sense because uh, your Java could be much smaller. It doesn't have all the weight that Scala yeah. does. And so that we're also Sorry, is that also motivated the move to uh, Rust? Yes, yes. Rust is, you know, all the efficiencies and, you know, everyone doesn't like to use Java. Mm -hmm. So um, exactly, just having uh, more flexibility and uh, more performance. We re really care a lot about performance. It makes perfect sense in this domain. And okay, so last question. Give me something in the future. Where do you think the whole Swim OS project is going to go next? To the cloud, right? <laughs> I mean, so you, you have all of your your queries, you have all of your uh, stream processing plumbing in there, and you basically have groups that uh, want whether it's dashboards or other type of applications, automations, and so. Everything else is being hand handled for you. So if I want to do things real time, if I want to see the latest information, uh, make the the latest 
most efficient queries and, and just really be up to date as possible. Uh, Swim's a great uh, technology there. And if we can automate that more so that you don't have to do as much of the work, we can basically look at the things we know we need to look at the, you know, the databases, Kafka and these different things. Yeah. And we can basically expose autom automatically real-time services for you and let you select, then I think that's the future. So will I, will there be a day sometime in the future when I can just give you my web agent code and it will just magically happen? Absolutely. And in addition to that, uh, no, I won't say that there's some similar, there's a lot of, nice ecosystem things that we're going to be enabling. <laughs> I almost got you to commit to uh, the feature roadmap, but oh well. You're probably wise to avoid that um, and wait till it's actually launched. Um, Fred, that was it's, it's a very interesting project. I still want to write some code to get more of a sense of the scope of it, but I think I know where I would get started now and what kind of things it could do for me. So thank you very much for uh, letting me grill you. And explain yeah. the project. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And uh, on this level of view, you talked about traffic. If you go to traffic.swim.inc, you mm -hmm. can see the, the the traffic. You can see a traffic demo that way. Ah, live demo. We love those. Uh, yeah. We'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Yeah. And also for just fun, you can do ripple.swim.inc. And that will I've, show you. I've seen that. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but it is a fun demo. <laughs> and you can just see the, you know, you get hundreds of people thousand or whatever i can't remember what um hardware we're putting that on but you can just see a lot of real-time interactivity i love a playful demo especially when it demonstrates some real underlying data flows so cool yeah it's been a pleasure thank you very much for joining us fred we'll see you again thank you well that's swim os I'm going to have to find some time to play with it. I want to go and get my hands dirty. It seems interesting and full of possibility, and I'll never really understand it unless I've written some code with it. So in the meantime, I'm glad they're working hard on solving those kinds of problems. Rumor has it that SwimOS will be speaking at Current, if you want to learn more, and Current is the next generation of Kafka Summit. It's Kafka Summit plus more streaming technologies, more real-time technologies, more speakers, more tracks. It's happening in Austin, Texas this October 2022, and tickets are on sale now, I believe, so I hope you will consider joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing some more people from SwimOS, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you, and I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of live coding myself. Uh, should be a good conference. If all that is too long to wait and you desperately want to see more event streaming code and Apache Kafka code, head to developer.confluent.io for code samples, tutorials, blogs, and lots more. And if you go through one of those tutorials, you're probably going to need a Kafka cluster. So you can try spinning one up at confluent.cloud, which is our Kafka cloud service. You can sign up and have Kafka running reliably in minutes. And if you add the code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get some extra free credit to run with. Meanwhile, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do click like and subscribe and the rating buttons and all those things everybody asks for. It helps. It helps us to know what you'd like to hear more about. And it helps like-minded people find us and join the show. And as always, my Twitter handle's in the show notes if you want to get in touch with me directly. And with that... It remains for me to thank Fred Patton for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.